Thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Lear, and I work with the marketing team at UMHS. September is Deaf Awareness Month. This month is dedicated to highlighting the importance of providing equal access to members of our communities who are deaf, hard of hearing, or experiencing hearing loss. This week is also the International Week of Deaf People. And the theme of this year's event is building inclusive communities for all. In recognition of these events, we are honored to welcome UMHS alumna, Dr. Christine Marshall and Karen Matthews, an interpreter for the deaf and an advocate for people with hearing loss. Both are children of deaf adults and offer a unique perspective on healthcare for people who are deaf. Welcome. Dr. Marshall, this year, the Academy Award winning movie, CODA, highlighted some of the challenges of being a child of deaf adults. You have a very personal connection with this. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience of growing up as a child of deaf adults? Sure, so um, I'm the oldest of two. I have a younger brother. Um, Growing up um, with having both of my parents deaf, uh, I did a lot of interpreting for them. So when we would go out to eat at restaurants, um, doctor's appointments, um, making phone calls, I took care um, of a lot of that stuff for them. Um, I think that's well, it. <laughs> that's great. Um, so you mentioned that you're, you have a brother, were there other hearing people in your household or your extended family? I, it was just my, um, my brother in my, uh, immediate family. Um, both of my parents, um, my dad was born with deafness. My mom developed deafness when she was young. Um, so all of their families, um, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, they're all hearing. So um, it's really just my dad and my mom from my family. And what were some of the challenges that you faced as a CODA? Um, so I think the biggest one was um, having to take on that responsibility of interpreting um, for my parents for pretty much everything. Thank you. And Karen, now we'd like to ask you about what your experiences were like. Could you tell us what it was like for you growing up in a household with parents who were deaf? Yes, I am the oldest of three. Um, I had a brother and a sister. Um, just like Dr. Marshall said, I would make appointments, make phone calls, go to doctor's appointments, anything that I needed interpreting for. I would always be there to do that for them. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Marshall, back to you. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey through school, um, what it was like for you going to school, having deaf parents, and how you ultimately made the decision to go to medical school? So my experience was a little different than uh, most people. So. Um, I actually dropped out of high school in 10th grade, um, I think mainly as a rebellion against my parents trying to get my childhood back um, and kind of do my own thing. Um, shortly after that, I got my GED and I decided to go to community college um, and I put myself through school. So I was working full time, going to school full time. Um, got a degree in health and physical education um, at community college. And then I went on to study um, biology at Temple University um, here in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, after that, um, I started working at a surgery center and that's when I really um, discovered my love of uh, medicine. I said, but I'm gonna go and I'm gonna become a doctor. 
um, I found UMHS um, and got accepted and here we are. <laughs> and were your parents supportive of your decision to go to medical school and how did they feel about you going to school so far away from them? Uh, they were very supportive. So um, as you can probably imagine, um, after dropping out from high school, um, they were like, okay, you're on your own. We're not helping you with anything. Um, once I started working, going to school, um, they kind of saw that I was serious about this and um, they became very excited for me, very proud. Um, and they were willing to, to do whatever it took to help me get through uh, medical school. So they were super excited for me. Um, probably a little sad that I went so far away um, with my clinical rotations. Um, of course, I had to explore the United States, so I went all over. Um, but ultimately, um, for residency, I, I came back home um, just to be close to family. Thank you. And Karen, this question is for you. What inspired you to become an interpreter? Um, my, my, the reason why I did it was because, um, I, I, before I went to work there, I would go interpret for my mom's friends at doctor's appointments and all this stuff. So I wouldn't just do it for my parents, but I would do it for all their friends. Um, so that's what made me realize that the interpreters were not being utilized as much as they should be in the health field. Um, so when I went, when I applied for there, I got accepted, you know, I got hired right away um, and I absolutely loved it because then I can advocate for them alongside with translating for them at their appointments or for whatever they needed. So that was my inspiration there. Perfect. And we had a few statistics that we just wanted to share during this discussion regarding the deaf community. Um, according to the World Health Organization, over 5% of the world's population requires rehabilitation to address their, quote, disabling hearing loss. The WHO also estimates that by 2050, over 700 million people, or one out of every 10 people, will have disabling hearing loss. So it's significant to healthcare providers to recognize that this is a growing population and to be prepared to provide care. Um, Dr. Marshall, we have a couple questions for you and we'd like to start with some definitions. What are some of the key differences between patients who are deaf and people who may have experienced hearing loss just as a regular part of aging? So, um... I think the biggest uh, difference is the culture. Um, so having hearing loss, uh, maybe later on in life, um, you're still trying to get through with, um, with things that you would do if you were still hearing. So you may not learn sign language. You're probably you know, straining to hear. You probably don't want people to know that you don't have um, all your hearing. You're probably writing down things more frequently, um, avoiding situations where you wouldn't be able to hear very well. Um, whereas um, being um, completely deaf um, pretty much from an early age, um, or coming from a family that has deafness um, throughout, um, it's more of a culture. You belong to um, the deaf culture. You're not just a person with deafness. You belong to a group of people. Thank you. I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, what is the appropriate language for people to use when they are referring to deaf patients? Um, so you really want to use um, patient first language, and, and this is really for anyone um, in healthcare that you're talking about. So you want to um, say basically the person first and then their um, disease or disability. So when talking um, about the death, you would say people um, with deafness or um, the patient who is deaf. Um, it doesn't define who they are, just like you um, wouldn't say that diabetic patient, you would say that person with diabetes. 
Thank you. And what are some of the common misconceptions about patients who are deaf? What are some myths that people should be aware of? So this, this is a big one that, that gets me. Um, a lot of people assume that they're dumb um, or they're not very smart, which is, is not the case. Um, there was a, a phrase, I know when my uh, parents were growing up, um, deaf, dumb, and mute. Um, and it was even written on my dad's chart that he was deaf, dumb, and mute. And my dad's one of the smartest people I know. So I think that's a huge misconception. Just because they can't hear, they can't speak the way we speak, doesn't mean that they're dumb. Thank you for that. Um, so how can doctors create a welcoming environment for deaf patients? Um, I think... One of the easiest ways is um, to just uh, show your willingness to communicate however they feel comfortable. Um, provide an interpreter, whether in person or using a virtual interpreter. Um, there are lots of apps that you can use um, on an iPad um, for interpreting services. Um, if you're part of a hospital, um, um, system, they usually have an interpreting uh, um, system. So um, getting an interpreter is probably the number one way to make them feel um, comfortable or asking them how they best uh, want to communicate and following their lead. So that brings up an interesting um, question. There is a memorable scene in the movie Coda where the girl has to interpret some doctor's instructions to her parents, and it creates a very awkward situation. Um, you mentioned that it can be uh, that you've had experiences that are uncomfortable having to translate for your parents. How much should doctors rely on family members to act as interpreters? Um, and what kind of accommodations are available so that patients who are deaf don't have to rely on family members to interpret? Yeah. So really, we should not be using um, family members to interpret. And this goes for any language, um, not just um, for patients who are deaf, um, patients who are Spanish or um, you know, Russian, whatever, um, you want to make sure that um, you're using a certified interpreter and not family members. Um, and it's so easy nowadays to get access to an interpreter um, with all the, the apps that are available um, that there shouldn't really be any reason to use uh, family members. Um, sometimes patients are just more comfortable with their family, um, but as in the movie, you can see it, it created a very uncomfortable um, experience for the daughter. Um, I've also had those experiences um, with my dad taking him to a urologist. Um, so you can imagine what we had to talk about there. Um, it's just really important not to use family members because one, if they're embarrassed, they may not say everything. Um, they also may not understand the situation completely, especially if you have someone who's younger. So, uh, you know, me and Karen having to interpret for our parents when we were young, um, not understanding the information that they're trying to get across, maybe making something up or leaving something out, um, that could be really important. Thank you. And then Karen, we have a few questions for you as well regarding um, just communication and interpreters. What are some of the common mistakes people make when trying to communicate with people who are deaf? Um, what I experienced was um, like the doctors would just speak to the deaf patient. Um, and they ought, like most doctors like that I've with my experience, they assume that they know how to lip read. Not all deaf people know how to lip read. Um, some are proficient at it, some are not. Um, but I just think that it's important, you know, that the doctor speaks to the deaf person, like look at Adam straight on, not at the interpreter, just look at the person so they can feel like, you know, they're being spoken to. 
Thank you. So you actually touched on a few questions I had, which is um, number one, how effective is lip reading? So let's say a patient who is deaf is pretty adept at deaf reading at lip reading. How much are they actually getting um, in terms of reading lips? Like how effective is it generally? Um, my stepfather, he reads lips, but I went with him to an appointment, you know, just as a backup um, because he said he wanted to, you know, see with the doctor, but from what I was looking at, he only got like 40, 50% of what the doctor was really saying. So I had to jump in and, you know, for the stuff that he, I don't know if he, if he didn't understand it or he didn't read his lips correctly. Um, like sometimes he confused with what words were being said. So um, it's not really effective, but it depends on the actual deaf person themselves as well. So perfect. And then another, another point that you touched on that I wanted to come back to was the etiquette of um, treating patients when they do bring in an interpreter. And you mentioned facing the patient um, and having the doctor speak to the patient as opposed to the interpreter. Just wanted to know if there's any other etiquette that healthcare providers should be aware of when they are treating patients who come in with an interpreter. Um, a lot of um, being a CODA, I, I realized that, like meeting that, you know, being in the deaf culture, um, there's different people have different education. Um, like my mother, she graduated high school, but she has like an eighth grade education um, compared, you know, to what ours is. So, and then my mom's other friend graduated from RIT. So it just depends on the education of each person because they're not all the same. Um, like Dr. Marshall um, touched on before that, um, you know, the education is just, it's not, the deaf culture is, is totally different from the hearing culture. It's just totally different. Perfect. And then something else that um, Dr. Marshall had mentioned during a call, um, an earlier call, is that there are actually some regional differences with ASL and that there might be some different dialects. So if you do have an interpreter, there might be, um, they might be communicating in a different way. I just wanted to see if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, I've actually um, seen a couple of different, um, cause I would like, cause I would sign different. Like I see Dr. Marshall signing, like, we, you know, not everybody, it's not like a universal language, like, cause we get being codas, we get stuck in making like our own signs, like, you know what I mean? So, um, there is different dialects. And I, I mean, what I've, what I've learned being a coda is that like deaf people don't use and the, like the common words that we would use, um, it's, it is different. Um, yeah, it's really different. And so as an interpreter, how can you make sure, because I'm sure there aren't signs for all of the medical terms. And so when you are interpreting at an appointment, how are you, how can you communicate some of those more complex medical terms to the patients who are deaf? And how can doctors ensure that what's being communicated is understood by their patients? Okay, so what I do is if I went into a doctor's appointment and I didn't understand, like I'll start interpreting it. And if I don't know the sign for a special word, um, I would ask the doctor to clarify or and explain more what the you know what that word means, and then I would just break it down for the deaf patient so then they can understand. And then when I'm done doing that, I'll ask the patient if they understand what I said from the doctor. And if they don't understand, I ask the doctor to clarify, you know, clarify it more. That's what I usually do. Perfect. And then this is a question for Dr. Marshall. Dr. Marshall, I was just wondering if you have had any experience when you've been treating patients who are deaf, um, as an example, trying to communicate something to them with complex medical terms that they might you know, be challenged to understand and how you've done that successfully, or if you had any stories that you wanted to share. Oh, I just realized that I have a glare, so I'm gonna try and move a little so you can see. All right, well, that's probably not gonna work. <laughs> um, so 
when I had um, deaf patients, I've had a couple. Um, if there's a really complex medical word, um, kind of like what Karen was saying, I'll try to break it down. So let's say, for example, um, the patient has gastritis. So I would explain that as um, something to do with the stomach um, and inflammation. So inflammation or infection, um, kind of like how the skin gets red and swollen. That's what's happening in the stomach. Um, so trying to break it down in that sense, um, simpler words um, that they would know more about that would make it easier to understand these big complex words. I'll also write down the word for them so they'll be able to, to look up more information on it later as well. Perfect. And just taking a step back for a moment, um, when we were talking earlier about sort of the do's and don'ts of treating patients who are deaf, what are some ways to just get their attention when you're first meeting with them, when you're walking into the exam room? Um, because I know that there are some things that are probably like flashing lights, um, that there are different meanings and ways that things are interpreted by people who are deaf. So I just wanted to get your insights on how to get their attention and some sure. other do's and don'ts. Um, so um, what I always do when I have a deaf patient, I will always um, still knock on the door before going in. Um, even if they can't hear me, I still do that. I open the door slowly. I have, uh, I had one deaf patient who was always like, why do you knock on the door? I can't hear you. Um, but that's, I don't know, that's just what I do. Um, but I'll open the door slowly. So in case they're standing near the door, I'm not hitting them. Um, if they're sitting facing the door, um, opening the door slowly kind of gives them a chance to notice that I'm there. Um, if they don't notice that I'm there, I may wave my hand um, gently to see um, if I can kind of catch their attention. Um, that typically works. Um, you definitely don't want to um, start waving your hands like frantically trying to get their attention or like kind of like getting in their face with your hand um, that could be seen as um, disrespectful, um, you know, just like a uh, a person who is hearing wouldn't want someone um, coming into their personal space, you know, five inches and screaming at them. Um, it's kind of the same way. Frantic movements, big movements mean loud. Um, so um, another thing would be if um, they had their back uh, towards the door so they didn't see me come in. Um, I may flick the light once um, or just tap them on the arm gently. Um, kind of again, um, if you go in and you start flicking the lights up and down, um, they're gonna think, well, that's really disrespectful. That's like you coming in and screaming, hey, look at me. Um, and also when you when you go to tap them, you know, you're, you're not trying to hurt them. You just you gently try and get their attention. So um, those are ways you can kind of try and get their attention without being disrespectful. Perfect. Thank you. And then something else that um, I was curious about is how to communicate with patients who are deaf in maybe an emergency situation where they won't have um, an interpreter or a family member there. What are some things that healthcare providers can do to put patients at ease in those kind of emergency situations? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple of things you can do, you know, with um, the whole COVID um, thing going on and the masks, um, that was really hard for a lot of um, patients who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, you've got the mask covering your lips. If they do some lip reading, um, they have some hearing, you're now muffled and they can't see your lips. Um, so that makes it really difficult for them to understand what's going on. Um, also, you want to make sure that you're not shining a bright light in their face. So, for example, 
um, awaking from surgery uh, and you've got this big light in their faces, they're awaking and, and they can't see what's going on because um, there's just this bright light and they're seeing blurs of people everywhere. Um, that can be um, really scary. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that they're able to see you, able to see your facial expressions. Um, so in an emergency, you know, a lot of times people are running around like crazy. Um, they may have their back towards the patient. So um, you really want to try and stay um, facing the patient as much as you can um, so they can kind of see what's going on. Um, you know, deaf, deaf culture um, is also about body language, not, not just the signs. So we kind of use our whole body um to sign so as they're watching what's happening in an emergency situation they they know what's what's going on they see the facial expressions they see the body movement so they're kind of taking in information that way as well perfect thank you um and sort of an extension of that question what are some of the biggest challenges that you have faced when either treating patients who are deaf or um you know, treating patients with significant hearing loss. Just wondering if you had any additional stories related to that. Um, yeah, so um, this is an interesting one. Um, I had a, a patient come in. Um, she was profoundly deaf. Uh, she had a skin tag on her inner thigh um, that I was going to remove. So um, as you can imagine, I'm using my hands to try and remove the skin tag, um, but I'm also trying to talk to her at the same time. So I'm trying not to, um, you know, get my gloves dirty um, and keep them sterile while I'm trying to explain to her what is happening next. So um, what I tried to do in the very beginning before I even started is I just explained the whole entire procedure. This is exactly what I'm doing step by step. Um, so she would kind of know what to expect. Um, and then as I got started, um, I would usually sign with just kind of one hand to, to let her know, okay, this is what's coming next. Um, or I would try and, you know, kind of tell her with my lips, see if she could, you know, understand a little bit of what I'm saying with my lips. Um, but that, that was challenging, but she was, she was fantastic. She, she had no problems with it. She, she appreciated that. I kind of explained the whole thing up front before we got started. Um, that really helped her kind of know what to expect and, and feel at ease. Perfect. Uh, and that kind of brings me back to another thing that you touched on earlier, which was the use of technology to help um, with communicating with patients who are deaf. And you mentioned the use of iPads. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the accommodations that are available, um, the rights the patients have, and how they're able to use technology to help with interpreting. Yep. Um, so according to um, the ADA, uh, patients who are deaf um, have the right to use whatever way of communication they feel most comfortable with. Um, a lot of patients who are deaf um, want an interpreter um, and they want an in-person interpreter, not necessarily um, a, a virtual one. Um, some patients are very comfortable um, just writing on pen and paper back and forth. Um, some feel okay with just lip reading. So uh, whatever way that they feel the most comfortable with communicating is the way you should communicate with them. So if they do want an interpreter, um, you know, definitely ask that before they make the appointment. Um, if they want a live interpreter, try your best to get one in there um, for them. Um, with all the technology nowadays, um, there's basically a virtual, you can get a virtual interpreter um, pretty quickly. Um, I know at my hospital system, we had an iPad that had an app. Um, we just clicked on it, clicked on the language and there was our interpreter. Um, the, the problem with that is kind of the different dialects from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, science can be a little bit different. So um, most of the time they do prefer 
um, an in-person interpreter. Perfect. And then Karen, this question is for you. Um, just curious, I know that there are some differences like Dr. Marshall was just talking about with East Coast versus West Coast. Are there also differences between like American Sign Language and British Sign Language? We're, we're all speaking English, but how does that vary? And are there differences there? Um, to actually, to tell you the truth, I don't know if there is a difference because I never actually saw a British person. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I'm pretty sure there is different dialects because everybody, I mean, there's always different dialects to every kind of language there is. Um, so I'm pretty sure they would probably be different, but um, I have not experienced it for myself, but I'm pretty sure there is. Thank you. And then just from your own personal experience, do you notice that patients who are deaf might be less inclined to seek medical care if they don't have an interpreter or someone who's available to help um, kind of communicate with their healthcare provider? Yes, so I, I, yes, I do. I think a lot of, um, even with like my mom's friends, like I'll try when I call to make appointments for them, I'll be like, you know, they need an interpreter and they're like, well, we can't get one for this, you know, such and such a day. Um, can they still come in and we can write notes? And, my, you know, some of my mom's friends, they can't, they don't understand the, you know, the American English way. Um, Cause like I said earlier that English and ASL are, they're not the same language you know what I mean they don't use and the uh, is but you know we just shorten everything when we're signing um but I did notice that a lot of my mom's friends would not go in unless they had an interpreter there so that's pretty interesting and kind of shows why it's important to have the technology too that could Correct. support um translating for patients who are deaf yep um Dr. Marshall, I was just wondering if you have any other stories from working with patients who are deaf or taking your parents to healthcare appointments, any, any stories or experiences you could share that might provide some insights for people tuning in who could potentially be working with deaf patients? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had one uh, patient in particular um, who was deaf, but her um, lip reading and her English was very, very good. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I, I would always sign to her, um, but she would, it's very, it's very hard to like try and type note and sign at the same time. <laughs> so that was something I, I always ran into, like most of the time with um, those appointments, I would not touch the computer. I would just sign and then I would write my note later. Um, but with, with her, she was super understanding. And um, I would always be like, do you understand my signing? I know my signing's a little bit different. You know, being a CODA, we, we all sign a little bit different. She's like, no, this is fabulous. Um, so she was just really appreciative that I would even, that I would even try. Um, I think with her, she had, she had a lot of stuff going on and trying to find um, specialists that were willing to take her on. Um, it's, it's pretty rare to find a provider that knows sign language. Um, and when, you've, when you're someone with a lot of medical problems and need to see a lot of different doctors, you kind of need them to all be on the same page. Um, so a lot of times for her, I was, I was kind of the middleman. I mean, being in family medicine, that's kind of what you are anyway. You're, you're kind of who uh, brings together all the, the specialists. So trying to find a specialist she would feel comfortable with, um, specialists that I knew would reach out to me if they needed any help with her, um, to, you know, answering any questions. A lot of times I would call the specialist up myself and say, hey, listen, I've got this patient. I want her to see you. Um, here's everything that's going on just so they have a good background before seeing her. Um, so I know that's, that's not something that um, can be done for everyone, but um, I, I tried to make a good effort into making sure that they got um, the same care as everyone else and had that chance to feel comfortable and understand 
um, what was going on. Great, thank you. And then Karen, this question is for you. And then we have, after this, we have a question from the audience, but I was just wondering, since you've been an interpreter at so many different doctor's appointments and with different patients, just in your experience, what are some things that some healthcare providers have done really well to make patients feel welcome? And what are some things that you've learned just are not helpful or not effective? Um, I went with some uh, same patients and we would go to the doctor like frequently. And um, so once the first time we went there, you know, I explained what I do. I said, you know, explain to them, you know, look at the patient, don't look at me. And then after going there, like frequently with them, they would automatically know how to react or how to speak to her when she was there for, you know, the, her appointments. Um, I found that a lot because um, I would be requested to go back to the same doctors with them um, by different patients. Um, and then there were some doctors that just wouldn't look at the patient at all and just would just keep looking at me. And I would be like, you know, can you look at her? Can you look at her? But um, that's what I would stress out to, you know, everybody to just please just pay attention to the deaf patient, make them feel comfortable in their office and stuff like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, kind of related to that question, here is one from our audience. And that is, what would be a good way to learn ASL? I know that UMHS has a club for it, but I know very little ASL other than some base things and some phrases. So it's a good question. Um, and Karen, let's start with you. What would be some, some good ways for people to learn some basic ASL or what might be some key terms that they should learn if they're gonna be working with patients who are deaf? Um, I actually found that YouTube, you can YouTube, um, ASL medical terms and stuff like that for beginners. And then they can just take the courses there because I've seen um, my mom's friend's daughters would do that because they weren't, they weren't CODAs per se, because they were they you know, they were hearing and then they lost their, you know what I mean? They lost their hearing later on in their, in their ages. But um, I think YouTube would be the best for them unless Dr. Marshall has somewhere else. Dr. Marshall, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I, actually YouTube is probably the best um, place. Um, there's one person in particular that I really like. Um, he's got glasses, bald, usually wears a black shirt. Karen, you've probably recognized him. He does a lot of um, um, videos. Uh, and he's, he's fantastic because he'll show different ways to say different words. Um, and he'll do like a whole segment on um, medical words or um, fruits and vegetables. So um, a really good way to learn kind of just basic words is going to YouTube, looking up medical words, and usually they'll go through a whole bunch. Um, I can probably do a couple um, now. So some of the ones that you should know um, would be patient. So doing a P, knowing the alphabet is probably a good thing too, if you can learn the basic alphabet, but um, P on your arm, um, kind of in a cross is for patient. Hospital is kind of the same way in a cross on the, on the arm. Um, doctor, Karen might sign doctor a little bit differently, but that's how I sign it. Nurse. Um, sick, health, um, pain. Those are, those are some good ones um, to know. So you can say, are you sick? Do you have pain? Um, um, doctor, nurse, uh, I don't know. Those are, those are probably some, some basic ones. There, there's a lot that you can learn, even if you just make an attempt and pick up a couple words or know how to at least say your name in the alphabet, um, patients that are deaf will really appreciate that. Thank you, I think that's really helpful. Karen, did you have any other phrases that come up regularly that you think people should learn if they're interested in, in signing? What are some key phrases that you use frequently? Um, like Dr. Marshall said, I would use patient, nurse, doctor, sick, pain. Um, my name is, like she said, finger spelling name. Um, 
those are the basic stuff that you should know being a in the health, you know, being a healthcare professional. Perfect. Thank you. And another question for you, just as an advocate for patients who are deaf, what advice do you have for doctors? Just other general advice um, for doctors that are interested in better kind of advocating for their patients. What are some things that doctors can do? I just think just knowing what the ADA laws are and what resources they have that, that they can do for the deaf patients, that would be the best thing for them. Perfect. Dr. Marshall, did you have anything to add to that as a physician? What resources do you think are valuable for patients who are deaf? Um, that I, I agree. Knowing, knowing the law, um, the ADA law, um, what their rights are um, and doing your best to um, provide whatever assistance they, they feel um, is best for them. Um, that's it. Perfect. Um, and at this time, I was just going to open up our Q&A to the audience. If anybody had any additional questions for either Dr. Marshall or for Karen Matthews, we'd welcome your questions. And you can type them into the chat. Also, I'm, I'm not sure if our moderator asked this in the chat or not, but we were curious if anybody that is in the audience is part of the deaf community, or if um, you have members of your family who are part of the deaf community, just are curious. both me and Karen signing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, and while we wait for any questions to come in, Dr. Marshall, did you have any other stories or any other advice that you wanted to share? Hmm. Any funny stories of going to the doctor with your parents or any other relatable um, scenes from the CODA movie? Um, I, I did just think of, there was one, um, one time when I was in medical school, um, I was doing my surgery rotation and I just happened to be in um, a surgery uh, where the patient was deaf. And, um, I wasn't able to see him beforehand, but when he woke up, um, from anesthesia, I was the first person he saw and I made sure that, you know, I was telling him what was happening and he was just like in shock. He's like, wait a minute, who is this person? Why is she signing to me? He's, oh. And he was just like, so happy that I was there, but so shocked, like, where did you come from? Um, and then I saw him after um, in the recovery room, and he was just really appreciative that I just magically appeared and, and started uh -huh. signing for him. So, um, so that was, that was really cool um, that I was able to even help out in medical school, um, make a patient feel comfortable. Um, trying to think if there's that's great. Other things. Karen, I was just curious if you could talk at all just about um, any trends or changes. Like, have you noticed that the delivery of healthcare to um, patients who are deaf with new accommodations that might be available, has it been improving? Is this something that you see as um, as something that's improving? Are you seeing like better treatment of patients who are deaf? Just kind of curious what uh, your take is. Yeah, I'm slowly seeing um, an improvement. Um, I'm seeing that the, the you know medical assistants are asking that, you know, cause usually when deaf people call, they call through the relay system. Um, so then that's how they, you know, the doctor's office know that they're, they're deaf or hard of hearing. Um, I've noticed that they are asking them, do you need an interpreter? Do you want in-person? Do you want um, a virtual? Um, so that's been, that's been slowly getting better, which is great. Um, but sometimes I have to call for my mom and I'm like, yeah, can you know set up an interpreter? They're like, can't you just come in with her? I'm like, no, I cannot just come with her. I said, you know, it is her law. It's her right. You know, she's allowed to get one. And then they would just try to come up with different excuses on why they couldn't get one 
And then, you know, I go back into my resources and I'm like, listen, you can, here's the name and number of a virtual interpreter. I think the most, the, I think the most issue for most of the doctor's offices is the cost of the interpreter. Um, I know that, you know, interpreting is not cheap. Um, cause like I, you know, when I was working at the communication connection, I was an interpreter, but then I also worked in the, in the office end. So I knew how much we were charging the facilities and stuff, but I think that is a big reason why the offices will not get an interpreter is because of the cost of the interpreter. So. Has technology reduced that cost at all? The, the like the iPads? No, no, okay. no. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, I know that you both mentioned that you had some valuable resources that um, that anyone interested could learn about. So I just wanted to point out that if anybody that's tuning in wants to get some additional information, that you can reach out to either Dr. Marshall or to Karen Matthews through their interview that is on the UMHS blog, the UMHS Endeavor. So for anybody tuning in that has um, questions or would like to get additional details, they can reach out that way. So just wanted to point that out and direct people to the UMHS blog um, for additional information. Um, okay, and then just before we wrap up, I just wanted to give uh, Dr. Marshall first a chance to just share any other words of wisdom or final thoughts. Um, really, I, I would say, um, don't be, um, afraid to interact with a patient who is deaf, um, and just do your best to communicate any way that, that they feel, um, is necessary. So, um, just the fact that you even try to communicate with them, um, they're going to be very appreciative. Perfect. Thank you. And how about you, Karen? Any other thoughts or words of wisdom for? I agree with Dr. Marshall. As long as you make the, uh, you know, make the attempt to make them feel comfortable and feel like they're one of us, you know what I mean? So I, yes, I totally agree with that. Perfect. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions from the audience, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, and again, if you would like any additional information, or if you would like to reach out to Dr. Um, Marshall or to Karen Matthews, please visit our blog, the UMHS Endeavor. There's some valuable information there and you can reach out to them directly. Um, and thank you so much to you, Dr. Marshall, and to you, Karen, you. for joining us tonight. Thank you. We really appreciate your time and your insight. And um, just thank you so much for being here. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night.